All right, Revelation chapter 10. He says, And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. Now, if you'll remember, this is in between the uh, sixth and seventh trumpet. Amen? We're getting a pause here to fill in and complete the narrative. He takes a break from the action uh, to give us some encouragement and insight concerning God's people. That's what he's doing. Because, I, like I said, I can imagine John seeing all this going on and thinking, what's to become of us? Amen? He did it between the sixth and seventh seal. He took a, uh, a pause and revealed the protection of God's people, naming the 144,000 and the multitude. Now we see him taking a pause between the sixth and seventh trumpets, which will sound in chapter 11 and verse 15, by the way, the seventh trumpet, to give us more encouragement and insight concerning God's people. And then after the seventh trumpet, before he reveals his wrath, in chapters 12 through 15, he pauses again, uh, for more details concerning the encouragement and insight of what's going to happen with God's people. Amen? So that's the way Revelation makes sense to me. It didn't make sense to me with this happens, then that happens, because a whole lot of stuff happens again. It's the same thing. Have you all noticed that? So uh, here we are in, in a pause in chapter 10, and he's seeing this mighty angel. Now, this mighty angel in verse 2, it says, And he had in his hand a little book open. Now, by the way, I believe that that could be the book that the seven seals had to be broken off of. And it doesn't really matter if it is or not, but I believe that's what it is. And I believe that book, at least uh, part of it, this little book, could be the book we're studying right now, and that's the book of Revelation. This could be the Lord handing John the book. Amen. That's the way we got every book of the Bible, wasn't it? God gave it to us. Amen. So anyway, he said he had a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot on the earth, and cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. Perhaps seven utterances of the wrath to come. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven hundred thunders uttered, and write them not. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that therein are, and the earth and the things that therein are, and the sea and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. Now, that time no longer there means, uh, it, it doesn't mean time stops, because we're going to see uh, later on in Revelation that there's a period of a thousand years. Well, you can't have time and not have time. Amen. That's not what that means. I heard a guy say one time, I hate that song when the roll is called up yonder. I said, well, why do you hate that song? I love that song. And he said, well, because it says, and by the way, this was the dean of a Bible college that said this to me. He said, uh, well, it says, when the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more. And there's time after that. I said, if you read the context, doesn't that mean no more time before the judgment comes? Oh, <laughs> do you like the song again now? Well, I guess so. <laughs> Amen. It doesn't mean that time stops. It means the waiting time for the judgment has stopped. Amen. So I just want to cover those right there because I want to, I want to, I just have to describe this angel a little bit to you from scriptures. And I think that'll take a little too much time for me to finish the chapter. So we're just going to go ahead and look at a couple things here. Uh, number one. Uh, we're going to see who this mighty angel is in verses 1 through 3. And then in verses 4 through 6, we're going to look at how he said to seal up those things. Seal up those things. So anyway, 
Let's get going here. He says, another mighty angel. Now, I know that a lot of people think that this angel here is Michael, the archangel. Um, now, let me just say right off, some people believe that Michael, the archangel, and Christ are the same person. You ever heard that before? We're going to go to Daniel 12 where it says that Michael shall stand up for his people and all that. We're going to look at all that. I don't believe that the archangel Michael and the Lord Jesus Christ are the same person. Hey Amen. I'm sorry. I just don't believe it. Um, so but if you believe it, hey, as long as you're, you know what salvation is and the church is and what you're baptized for, we'll get along. Amen. Um, it doesn't matter at this point. I don't think, but I think that we'll run into some confusion if we try to um, uh, support what we're reading here with the book of Daniel. We will ter have terrible misunderstandings and confusion if we label Jesus Michael. Amen? He's not. Um, anyway... So I believe it's not Michael. Let me, let me show you why. Go over to Daniel chapter 12. Now, I know when I go over to Daniel 12, there's a can of worms that could possibly be opened here. Uh, but I'm going to try to avoid any cans and any worms. Amen. Just simply because that's a different study and we don't have time for that here. But I would love, if anybody has any questions or debate about this, it would make my day. All right. Why I do not believe this is Michael, uh, that Michael is not the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. He says <clears throat> in Daniel 12 and verse 1, And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was, since there was a nation even to that same time, and at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. Now you see people can confuse and say, see Michael is just another name for the Lord Jesus, like David and so on. Now, here's where the confusion takes off, okay? And we'll bring a little bit more of this later, and maybe we'll have to do some lessons on it later. Maybe we'll study Daniel, okay? But uh, <clears throat> most dispensationalists interpret Daniel chapter 12 as the great tribulation, the time of the beast, the time of Revelations talking about at the seventh trump and all that. It's not. The question was asked of Daniel, what's going to be the state of my people? And that was all the way back in chapter 9. In chapters 9 through 11, this um, Gabriel is who I believe it is, and his name is even mentioned, uh, starts informing Daniel of well, what's going to happen next. He gives him the 70 weeks and talks about Messiah being cut off. He goes in and gives more details in chapter 11 and starts talking about all the wars that are going to happen between that time. Amen. And when we get to chapter 12, what he's talking about, he's still answering Daniel's question. Folks, when was the end of the Jewish nation? A.D. 70. This is what he's talking about here. Amen. Daniel 12. Michael shall stand up. Now, I, if I remember, I don't have it written in my notes here, but if I remember, I'll talk about why it's Michael. Okay? But I don't believe it's the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm going to show you why. Amen. He says, And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. Okay? Now, let's put a little context there. Look with me back at Daniel chapter 10. Daniel chapter 10 and look at verse 13. It says, But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 
one in 20 days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. And I remained there with the kings of Persia. Now notice there's a, a prince of Persia that's evil and a prince called Michael, which is good. And he's called one of the chief princes. Yeah. Jesus Christ is not one of the chiefs. Right. He's the chief. Right. Amen. You see the difference? Go down to verse 21, uh, or 20, I should say. Then said he, Knowest thou wherefore I come unto thee, and now will I return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Grecia shall come. Now we know that when Persia, which Daniel was in that, uh, in that um, nation at that time. Amen. And he's making it clear that there's going to be a demonic influence that leads Grecia <laughs> to take over the world. And that's Alexander the Great and all that. And in chapter 11, he goes through every bit of that. Amen. Lays it all out for us. But then in verse 21, he says, But I will show thee that which is noted in the Scripture of truth, and there is none that holdeth with me in these things but Michael, your prince. So when he's talking about princes here, it seems to me that there is a prince of Grecia, there is a prince of Persia, and now we hear of Michael, who's a prince of whom? God's people. A prince of God's people. Now, the Bible teaches us that angels are very, very interested in the church. And when Jesus said that day, know ye not that I can call on my Father and He shall send twelve legions of angels to save... Who do you think was going to head that group up? Michael. Michael is a created being. He is... He and Satan are equals. Now, I don't have time to go through all that, but that's just what I believe. Uh, a lot of people think that God and the devil are opposites of each other. That's impossible because God has no opposites. God has no opposites. He's a self-existent being, and therefore He created others. If you're created, you're not the opposite of God. What can, can be compared to God? Amen. You say, what's the opposite of boy? Girl. Yes, 2018. We're still saying that. What's the opposite of light? Dark. Amen. What's the opposite of God? There is no opposite. Well, what's the opposite of the devil then? Michael. Michael, the archangel. Amen. So, uh, and what really sums this up for me um, is in Jude 9. Let me just read it to you so you don't have to turn there. You can be going back to Revelation 10. In Jude 9, he says, Yet Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. Right, exactly. Does that sound like the Lord Jesus Christ no. to you? No. And I, I don't believe we mystically change who Michael is. Hey, Michael would be embarrassed if we called him the Lord Jesus. Yep, amen. Amen. That would be upsetting to Michael. We're going to meet Michael one day. Amen. Boy, what a great individual to meet. Woo! <laughs> yep. But he's nothing compared to our Savior. Right. Nothing. Amen. Amen. So I don't believe that this is Michael the archangel. We know in, in, in Daniel 12 it said, Michael will stand up, that great angel, for thy people. He's talking about in A.D. 70. And let me tell you what happened in A.D. 70. The, the temple and Jerusalem was ransacked by Titus, General Titus of Rome. The campaign started in 66 AD. He made a covenant with them. And three and a half years later, which brings us to 70 AD. See, they were in 66 AD, so about a half year in. And he makes a covenant with them. Oh, we're here for your peace. You know, that's how governments do. We're here for you. We're here to make... We're here to give you democracy, right? And then three and a half years, that covenant was broken. It's starting to sound a little familiar. And the, he came in and ransacked that place. And it took three and a half years to finish the job. And the campaign was from 66 A.D. to 74 A.D. 
Amen? So uh, that's what was going on there. And how did Michael stand up for the people? I'll tell you how. Because Titus Vespasian's mission was to wipe out the Jews. But he didn't wipe out all the Jews because the folks that got saved, the folks that were part of the church, they saw the signs that Jesus gave them in Matthew 24 that when Jerusalem is surrounded by armies, before the abomination of desolation, in other words, before Titus sets up his, his post there and he's God now, flee! Yeah. And they did. And Michael protected them. Yeah. Amen? According to the, the storyline here, the narrative, Michael protected them. Don't you know we're protected? Don't you know that, that the angels came and ministered to Christ in the time of His temptation? Listen, the Bible says that we shall overcome the beast by the blood of the Lamb and by our testimony in Him. Right. Don't you know that there's a time of grace that God will give us to stand? Michael can protect us all he wants, but God will, may call us to the place of martyrdom. And as we stand and we face the devil in a stare down and God's grace is upon us and we lose our head, burn alive or whatever, that that's a greater deliverance and a greater uh, uh, indictment to the hearts of the wicked than to see Michael delivering us. Amen. But Michael did deliver. He delivered in AD 70 because all them people, not one church, they didn't lose one church member and all that. Isn't that amazing? I mean, when you read about this, buddy, they went through there and there wasn't a tree found in the land because they used them all for crucifixion. And they crucified man upon man upon man, living upon living upon living. Yeah. As much as they could get on a tree, they crucified millions of people, slaughtered. But not God's people. Amen. Not God's people. So you see the prophecy fulfilled. Amen. All right. Now that you know a little bit there, I believe this angel here, this mighty angel, is none other than the Lord Jesus Himself. You say, now wait a minute, Brother Sam. He's an angel here. Well, we saw Him as a lamb already. We've seen Him as a lion. He's been called the Root. That's capital R. He had seven eyes and seven horns. You think the Lord Jesus is walking around with seven eyes and seven horns? No, I think there's something here that, that we need that, that requires investigation, don't you? So anyway, let, let's keep your hand here. And now let's go over to Genesis 16. Let's go back to the book of beginnings here very quickly. And let's look at the fact that Jesus is sometimes called... An angel. Genesis 16, and I want to look at verses 7 through 10. It says, And the angel of the Lord found her by a fountain of water in the wilderness, by the fountain in the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, whence camest thou, and whither wilt thou go? And she said, I flee from the face of my mistress, Sarai. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Return to thy mistress, and submit thyself unto her hands. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered for multitude. You cannot find in Scripture where an angel has the authority to multiply seed and prophesy. Right. That's God's business. The angel of the Lord here, as we've taught before, you can find it online. That is a pre-incarnate appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So he's called an angel there. Let's uh, jump over to Genesis 48. I just want to show you a few. You can, you can do your own study. And, of course, that's what I desire is for folks to do their own study and compare our findings. Amen? Genesis 48. And look with me at verses 15 and 16. And he blessed Joseph and said, God, before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac did walk, the God which fed me, all my life, 
long unto this day, the angel, capital A, which redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads. Let my name be named on them in the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. Jacob speaking, you know, he wrestled an angel. Y'all remember that? And then we found out that that angel was the Lord. He, he said, I looked. He said, I, he said, God's blessed me. I've looked on the Lord and I've lived. Wrestling with an angel. He actually wrestled with God. <laughs> Called him an angel there, didn't he? Hmm. Interesting. In Isaiah 63 and verse 9, Jesus Christ is called the angel of his presence. In Malachi chapter 3 and verse 1, he's called the messenger of the covenant. The word messenger being the exact same Hebrew word as angel. Because an angel is a messenger. It doesn't have to necessarily be a winged being, which, by the way, we don't see those in Scripture. You never see an angel with wings in Scripture. That's a bunch of garbage. That's not true. All right. Let's look at his description a little bit, and this sums it up for me as well. Look what it says about him there. First of all, he come down from heaven. That's interesting. I, I've not seen that phraseology with angels before. Uh, but we know the Lord Jesus Christ came down from heaven. And we know that He came among His own and His own received Him not. Amen. He is the God of heaven and He came down from heaven. So there's a nice description of Him there. And then He goes on and He says, clothed with a cloud. I think that's very interesting because of the fact that uh, when, when God showed up, it was in a cloudy pillar. Was it not? Cloud by day and fire by night. Yep. That's when God showed up. Nobody, no angel ever did that. But God did. And what we're seeing here is Christ is manifesting uh, Himself as the same God of the Jewish people of the tabernacle. Okay? And here He goes. Then He's got a rainbow upon His head. Now, I don't know how that fits. I don't know what that is. Um, but we do know that the rainbow is a picture of grace and mercy. God said He would set His bow in the clouds and then if we'd see that bow, we look to that bow, it is a covenant between God and us that He will not flood the entire world again. Amen? So a rainbow means God's mercy and grace. What this is telling me is that as this mighty angel comes down, we're, I think we're just seeing the Lord Jesus in a different perspective. And He is about to say, time no longer. He's about to pull in His own and judge the world. But notice there's that rainbow of mercy. He's still willing to save souls. He's still willing to wash them white as snow. But as we found out last week, they repented not. Yep. Amen. He had a face as the sun. Interesting. You know, the Lord Jesus Christ at His transfiguration shined like that. Matter of fact, when He was dying, He put out the sun. He made it dark for three hours on the cross. He did that. But as living, He's the day star. <laughs> He is, he outshines the sun. This is all descriptive of Christ. And he had feet as pillars of fire. Feet as pillars of fire. Judgment. Wrath. Now, what sewed it up for me, this is all, everything that I'm saying is a little bit conjecture, a little bit. A little bit of comparison of types. Amen. I'm not satisfied with preaching and teaching that just compares types because types a lot of times are subject to the interpreter. Amen? But what really sold it for me that this is the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm going to show you. Look at Revelation 11 and verse 3. 
the angel still talking, the same person, he says, and I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days, clothed in sackcloth. Jesus is the only one who said, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. God gives power. Angels are never shown in Scripture to give power. Right? This, this is a godly being here. This is not... See, see why I don't believe that's Michael? Amen. Amen. Now, <laughs> in verses 4 through 6... It says, and when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth, lifted up his hand to heaven. Now, here he is standing with one foot in the sea, one foot on the earth. Okay, lifting up his hand to heaven. And verse 6 says, And swear by him that liveth forever and ever. You don't ever see angels doing that. God, who could swear by no greater, the books, book of Hebrews tells us, swear by himself. Yes, he did. That's what he's doing right here. Yeah. Amen. Boy, isn't it amazing when you compare Scripture to Scripture, Amen. what you come up with? Come up with truths, what you come up with. He said, Who created heaven and the things that therein are, and the earth and the things that therein are, and the sea and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. Now, we've seen this type of activity before in Scripture. This is not the first time an angel has stood on, or a person, we, didn't, we know this is the Lord Jesus Christ, this is not the first time that he has stood with his feet in water, one foot in the water, one foot on the land, and uh, cry out to heaven and all that. This is not the first time we've seen this. Matter of fact, if you'll go back with me to Daniel chapter 12. I'll tell you what, go to Daniel chapter 10 instead. Daniel chapter 10. Now remember, chapter 9 is the 70 weeks prophecy. That's the prophecy that the uh, beginning about the Jewish people and what's going to happen. We get an overview in chapter 9 that after they put down the Lord Jesus, so they think, after they cut Him off, God will make them desolate. And a prince will come and break a covenant with them, as we have described. It happened in A.D. 70. A look at chapter 10 now. As he starts going along, he starts uh, praying here. Daniel's praying. He's trying to figure out, you know, what in the world is this that God's showing me? And then we, we get to verse 5, and it says, Then I lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose loins were girded with fine gold of Uphaz. His body also was like the barrel, which, by the way, is an amber glow. His face as the appearance of lightning. His eyes as lamps of fire, and his arms and his feet like in color to polished brass. And the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men that were with me saw not the vision, but a great quaking fell upon them so that they fled to hide themselves. Therefore I was left alone and saw this great vision and there remained no strength in me for my comeliness was turned in me into corruption and I retained no strength. Now that, I, I want to submit to you that that's exactly the same way that Isaiah acted uh, in Isaiah chapter 6, when he saw the Lord in his temple high and lifted up, he became as a dead man. Amen. That's the way the Apostle Paul became when he met Jesus on the Emmaus Road. I believe this man here he's talking about is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there's, there's a, a big talk here. Gabriel gets involved, starts giving some prophecy and so on. And then it brings us up to chapter 12. 
And let me just begin in verse 5 there. Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, there stood other two, the one on this side of the bank of the river and the other on that side of the bank of the river. And one said to the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? Now we see a man standing over the river and his description pretty much looks like what we just read in Revelation 10. But then we see men on either side of this river asking, how long before all this happens? Folks, we're going to get into Revelation 11 in a week or two and that's all about the two witnesses. You see the same picture? It's the same picture, except this one here, he's not in the sea. He's on the rivers of waters. Okay, verse 7. And I heard the man clothed in linen, which we know is the Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, there he is, that in the clothed in linen. That's his priestly attire. Amen. That's not his coming back in vengeance attire. That's his priestly attire. He says, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand into heaven and swear by him that liveth forever and ever that it shall be for a time, times, and in half. When he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of, thy, of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. And I heard, but I understood not. Then said I, O my Lord, what shall the end of these things be? And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Now, again, in Daniel chapter 12, the time of the end. Is that the end of all ages? No, the question is the end of God's people, the Jews. The end of Israel as a nation being God's chosen people. I know that's hard for people to swallow, but the church is called the Israel of God. God's program has always been to save Gentiles. People say, well, you know, it started with Abraham. There were people saved before Abraham. And by the way, when Abraham was saved, he was a Chaldean. Okay? He was a, he was a idol worshiper just like everyone else. And the Bible teaches us that God preached the gospel unto Abraham. That's a quote. Abraham got saved just like everybody else has to. Right. And God decided to use his nation to bring his son through. And then once that's done, they rejected his son as a nation. These people have no standing with God. Right. Not as a nation. Even John the Baptist said it very clearly. Think not to say unto yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. Right. For God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Right. He said, you better quit thinking about who you are and you better start turning to who he is. Yep. Amen. So here in Daniel, this is all about A.D. 70. So we see the man, we see the same thing about the prophecy of the end of, of the Jewish people being used by God. And you know what I mean by that. I, I, Jewish people can still get saved. Anybody can get saved. Right. Amen. Anybody can get saved. It's just, I'm so sick of saying the Jews are God's chosen people. Show me that in the Bible. Right. You can't show me that in the Bible. Now, you could show it to me, you know, three or 4,000 years ago, but you can't show it to me now. And by the way, God has always used a remnant. How about Ruth? Was she a Jew? No, she was a Moabite. A Moabitess. As a matter of fact, God even said, no Moabite shall ever enter the kingdom of heaven. But yet, she did. She's in the line of Christ. See, because she quit being a Moabite, she got saved. She yeah. became a child of God. Right. Amen. What about um, a a what's her name? The harlot. Uh, Rahab. Rahab the harlot. I almost said Ahab. <laughs> Rahab the harlot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not a not a Jew. But yet, these two women that I've just named to you are both in the lineage of Jesus Christ. 
See, somebody's being doofed here. Somebody's being duped, I should say. We're doofs for being duped. And that is this whole thing of, oh, Palestine and this and that and that and this. What you see over there is not the fruit of God saving anybody or sparing land. What you're seeing there is the English Empire trying to hold its own and making the deals with the bankers of the world so that they can make money and keep wars going in the Middle East. It's that simple. It's always that simple. We've got enough military experience here. What's it about, boys? It's about money. You giving your life, you say, well, I'm a, I'm a ammunition technical advisor. No, you're not. You're an M1A1 bullet stopper. That's what you are. Well, I went to school for nine months just to get shot. Yeah. That's what it is. It has nothing to do, none of this has anything to do with righteousness or of God or... In our case, I'm sorry, democracy. <laughs> they had a whole lot more freedom in, in Libya before we showed up, bombed the place. Yep. Amen. They were having their own currency, as a matter of fact. Anyway, let me get off of that. <clears throat> now, there in, in Daniel 12, in verse 5, uh, let's see, we went on. Okay, we got to verse 7. Look at verse 8. And I heard, but I understood not. Then said I, O oh my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. Now, those principles can be applied to the end days that we're in. But specifically, this is the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70 that he's talking about. Amen. If this is not, then it's a can of worms that will bring much confusion. So I don't believe this angel that we see in Revelation 10 is Michael. Amen. I see it as being the Lord Jesus Christ. We see Him in another aspect here. I think we've proven it scripturally. And He has given us a narrative here in between the um, sixth and seventh trumpets to encourage us and to give us insight concerning His people. Amen? Uh, and the people of God understand these things. And I know some things are hard to be understood. I get that. We're going to see later where he was to eat that book and it tasted sweet, but man, it made his belly bitter. Yep. It, was, it was hard to digest. There's some things that as you start reading the Bible and things start coming open when you compare Scripture, they're a little hard to take in. Because after all, we've been raised hearing about the rapture. Yeah. We, we've been raised hearing about God helps them that helps themselves. Well, if I'm good enough, God will say, well, you tried, so come on into heaven. We've been so twisted that when you bring truth, it's a little hard to understand. But God's people understand these things. There's some things I don't understand. There's some things, especially we get in chapter 11, I don't know exactly what's meant by that. But that's scriptural because God told us when He showed us with Daniel and He also showed us again here that it's going to be something that He reveals to us as we need it to be revealed. It's kind of like grace. I don't need dying grace right now because I'm not dying. But when I am, it'll be there. Amen. Amen? So God's people understand these things and maybe as they unfold... Um, you know, not, not fully now, but as they unfold, we'll fully recognize them. And I believe here is a message of mercy. This looks like the God of the tabernacle. A message of mercy. This is Christ saying, listen, I haven't sounded the last trumpet yet. You can be saved. But I want you to know when He returns, and we will see that in Revelation 19, there won't be any symbolism and there won't be anything mystical about it. We won't have to compare Old and New Testament to figure out who this is. It's going to be very clear. 
because on his vesture is going to be King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Amen? And he will come and destroy the beast and every false prophet and their armies. Amen? He will destroy them just by the word of his mouth and the blood of the br- will be up to the bridles in the valley of Hinnom. Amen? Uh, I'm sorry, the valley of Megiddo. So, amen. There you have it. That's what I believe. Let's pray and we'll be dismissed. God bless you. Thank you for your patience.